everyone, this is Bob Tribe, and we're hosting another episode of Valley to Vietnam, where we interview primarily local people who served in Vietnam. Our guest today is Jim Rushford, who served with the Air Force in Vietnam. And Jim, thanks for coming in today. Always good to see you. We've known each other forever. Jim and I went to the same high school, although I didn't hang out with him. He was a freshman, I was a senior, and they were two beneath us but uh, my brother was a freshman in that same class. So you were born here in Sacramento? Yes. Where? Southern Memorial. Ah, no light shone on the, your room in the, from heaven. I don't know, it was too little. Okay, yeah. Um, and in 1947, when you were born, uh, where did your family live at that time? At that time, I think my folks had a little place in downtown, and I don't know the address. Oh, okay. But soon thereafter, they moved out to um, Del Paso Heights on Acacia Street, which is kind of out by, well, it's Del Paso. Isn't that Del Paso Heights? Yeah. 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 And then they moved, when I was one, they moved to Arden Park. I see. Um, so you went to several grammar schools. Yeah, uh, you have here, you went to Greer, Marymount, and Art. How is it that you went to, because you changed uh, physical location, or why is it that you went to three different grammar schools? No, I was one when we moved to Arden Park. So okay. when we started kindergarten, there were not enough classrooms for everyone. And we had, but it was through Arden School, we had class actually right around the corner from our house on Toledo's Court in the Bell's house. They had a rumpus room. And then for first grade, we're still under Arden, but we had class in some other people's house um, down the street. And then when second grade rolled around, they started busing us all to Greer. Okay, and where's Greer? I Greer mean. is uh, Hurley Way at Bell right next to Encino High School. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, I know that. Yeah. So, yeah. So, just for our audience here, Arden Park is an area bounded by Arden, Fair Oaks, Eastern, and Watt. Correct. That's a huge area. It is. And didn't that really start building up in the last late 40s after World War II? Yeah, when we moved there, our house was one of the few on La Sierra Drive. Oh, wow. You could see from our house all the way across Watt Avenue when they started building Auburn, or Auden, uh, Arden Manor. Wow. Yeah. People were always upset that we were building little houses back there. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I have a lot of friends that grew up in Arden Park. Uh, it's a nice area. Um, and you went to El Camino High School. I did. And you graduated in 64. 64, that's correct. Um, so, who were your friends in high school? Mm. Your brother, Terry, who's kind of a hot rod friend. Yeah. Uh, my buddy, Bill Burns, he was in your class, actually. He was Bill Bryant then. Oh. Um, Larry Williams, a kid that came from all over the world because he was a military family. Right. Those were kind of my best friends. Um, Roger Linderman, my next door neighbor, was a friend. Jim Slotman was a friend that we hung out with. Jeff Dexter was a friend in high school. He's deceased. Mm, I'm not kind of friends with everybody, but those were the ones I hung out with. Yeah, most of those guys I don't know, but I remember Slotman because he ran around with my brother too. Mm -hmm. so, he did. And was killed in Vietnam, unfortunately, with the first calf. Um, what do you remember most about growing up in Sacramento? Hmm. You said that you... It's a nice place. I, mean, it's just, I like Sacramento. It's, I remember... Um, hanging out in Arden Park with the kids there. There was, our street was all kids. Your friend John Hamilton was a neighbor across the street and there were people next door to him that we hung out with. There was a whole block of kids. I remember that really well. And then by the time we got to eighth grade, we had moved over to um, Cottage and Walnut over in that area across from the OLA church. And over there, we had a lot of fun with the kids because there were a lot of kids on the street. We also spent a lot of time down the river. The river was a big, just the bottom of Arden 
I know way. OLA, that's Our Lady of Assumption Catholic Church. Yes. Yeah, my old parish. Yes. Did you know Wilson Farrell? Yeah, he lived next door to me. Okay, yeah. yeah. He was in my class. Hot Rod. He was a hot rod. Good hot rod. And, and your friends, a lot of your friends were hot rod. That's what I focused on. Yeah, yeah. go-karts and hot rods. Because yeah. I, I know that you've got some a classic truck and that you, you know, were in that sort of thing. Now, you said you also spent a, long, a lot of time at the American River. Oh, yeah. Like doing what? Rafting down to Watt Avenue and hitchhiking back. Oh, yeah. yeah. And also... On inner tubes, mostly we didn't have rafts. You know, you have that wonderful bike trail that I've used many times to bicycle on all the way up to uh, Folsom Lake and back, but there was no bike trail. That wasn't developed, and there was no. a gravel company down at the end of Arden Way. It was almost like a jungle. It yeah. was. And we'd go down there and have BB gun fights yep. with no mask and shoot each other, guys getting shot in the head, which was pretty stupid. But um, you also, when you were old enough to kind of drive, you talked about cruising K Street. Now, that was a big, big deal here. That was Saturday. a big deal. We also, though, down the river, we had what we called the river machines. And at the corner of Fair Oaks and Arden, and Walnut, there was a gas station there, a uh, Douglas station. And the guy that owned that was old enough to be our dad, but going on 18. And so we would find cars, truck was a ringleader. We would find cars that were on their last legs, buy them really cheap, like 50 bucks. And then we take them down to the river and drive them until they wouldn't run anymore, and then right. we leave them. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were going up and down hills. It was yeah. really a lot of fun because there was all those big rock piles and sand dunes and all kinds dugout of dugout places. Yeah, it was yeah. really fun. Yeah, and I remember in my class, a lot of people had sort of big beer parties down there too, with campfires and all that sort of thing. Yeah, I didn't and do the that. The sheriff's department would raid those every now and then. I skipped that. I didn't do that. People would start swimming across the river if they didn't have their car parked there. <laughs> we would cruise K. That's dangerous. That was kind of after high school. I had a 57 Ford convertible, and that was really good for cruising K. Yeah, you know, if people have seen the movie American Graffiti, then you know exactly what it was like. We lived it. Yeah. Yeah. It would, you'd stop at Mel's Drive-In and, uh, you know. Right downtown. See yeah. people right at 19th and J Streets. Everything in that movie is something that either happened or we heard happened when we were kids. Even the cop chain on the back of the cop's car, I heard about that. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you had a 57 Ford, you said? After, after high school. In high school, I had a 41 Ford. Yeah. Right. But you didn't have a 41 Ford engine in it. Yeah, I did, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. I'll be nice. It's souped up. Um, now, before you joined the military, you worked at several different jobs. Now, why don't we talk a little bit about each one? Okay. Alice Body Shop. Al always had a shop adjacent to my dad's business because my dad was had a repossession and collection business and needed a warehouse and space. Uh -huh. And a lot, Al and he just were buddies and so we always had a body shop there. And it was really convenient for dad because out of state cars a lot of times are banged up. The bank doesn't want them back. Right. Just fix it up and sell it. Yeah. So, so what was your job there? Grunt. Yeah. yeah. Did you work on cars then? I sanded cars, a lot of sanding. A lot of masking, no pounding. Yeah. Yeah. Painting. No. Well, primer. He let me put primer on a spot where you're you're working down the scratches. You prime it, sand it down, prime it again, sand it down, trying to fill the scratches. So this was a good job for you because you were really interested in cars. Yes. Yeah. Take out a shop at school. Yes. Uh, Vans Market. Oh, hold it. Just one more thing. Alice Body Shop. Where was that located? Franklin and Fruit Ridge, oh, so across from the new Coconut Grove Ballroom. South area, yeah. Franklin and Fruit Ridge. Oh, I know right where that is. Yeah. Is that where uh, Caballo Blanco is? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And there was, yeah, there was a ballroom upstairs, right? Yep. I know the place. Ike and Tina Turner Review used to be there. Really? Yes. Wow. Vance um, Market. Yeah, that was in Carmichael, Vance number eight. Yeah. I, I know. Ferrox Boulevard. Boulevard, just uh, north of Marconi. Okay. Uh, and what did you do there? Uh, I was a bag boy, and I don't remember if I started as an apprentice clerk or not before I left. Okay. Then Sunset Fair Market, which I've never heard of. 
That was where Bella Brew is now on the corner of uh, Arden and Fair Oaks Boulevard. Oh, sure. Yeah. I go to Bella Brew all the time. Yeah. So that was yeah. that was a good store. I like working there. Uh, so places you frequented. Let's talk about Sam's Hop Bro. What was the big attraction there? Same as it is now. I still go to Sam's. Hop Bro. I do too. Yeah. Everybody hung out there. You yeah. go to you go there, especially on the weekend nights, and half of my class from El Camino was there. Right. And I'd come home on leave. First place I'd go was Sam's. Half of my class would be there. Yeah. Yeah. It was a good hangout. Ah, uh, yeah. They wouldn't serve us beer. But That's right. Met a couple of girlfriends. There you go. Yeah. Uh, did you hung out at Folsom Lake? We're talking about Granite Bay. We're talking about watching the submarine races up on the parking lot next to the dam. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A little bit of going in the lake, but yeah. Yeah. I had a little boat. I guess I was in high school when I had a little boat. We used to go out there and float around with a little motorboat. Yeah. Now you probably can't stop at the dam because they don't want someone to blow it up. You can't even get down to it. Yeah. 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 Um, and then a place I've never heard of, Lou's Drive-In. I think you said it was at Marconi and Eastern. There were three. There's now one oh. on Watt Avenue, kind of out. Yeah. But there was one on Marconi and Eastern and one out on Auburn Boulevard after you make the turn at Southern Corners. Yeah, Lou's was good. That was um, Mariloma and El Camino, a little bit of La Sierra. Did you ever go to the Orange Freeze on Long Island? which became something else. At Merlino's, hand. it was Merlino's, and yeah. then now it's Hazel's. Yeah, we still go. Yeah, yeah. Terry liked to go there. Yeah, that's a good place. Um, it is a good place. So how old were you when you went in the military? Mm, it was 1966, so I was 19. Okay. And um, you mentioned something on your questionnaire about the draft. Were you about to be drafted or what? Yeah, what I did, I, I flunked out of AR twice. I didn't open a book. I was working on my car and seeing my girlfriend. So, and working at the grocery store. So my buddy and I went and took the entrance test for the Air Force because we knew it was coming. Yeah. And uh, this must have been around May or June of 66, probably May, I got a draft notice and I called the Air Force recruiter and I told him, I said, you know, Sergeant Fletcher, I still remember his name. Uh, I got my draft notice and he said, well, don't worry about it. I can just tell him I got you because I got really good scores on the, on the uh, exam. There were four categories. And I said, well, yeah, but you're offering me two years or four years and they're offering me two. And he said, if you let them take you, they're going to give you a rifle and send you to Vietnam. If you let me take you, you're going to wear a blue shirt and a nice coat and work in a nice environment. So you pick. And I said, I'll be down to sign the papers in a few minutes. So. And uh, so, but you were in almost four years. Yes. Right? Yeah. And, and, his, and his prediction didn't come out to be true. Well, you know, I ended up with the right one. My time. army recruiter lied to me, too. Well, he didn't know. My guy didn't know. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're, you're, you're being kind about it, but I don't know about that. So you go to the Air Force in June of 66. Yeah. And, of course, basic training for, I think, all the Air Forces at Lackland we Air Force Lackland. Base in San yep. Antonio. We only had four weeks because they were jamming us through. Okay. Yeah. So four weeks there, and then at some point they determined that you're going to go to one of the tech schools. Yeah, you go, you take testing. I tested for language school because I was Monterey and that sounded good to me. Yeah. But I didn't realize it was a time to test. So I got every answer right, but I didn't finish. Oh. So I had previously selected weather. When I enlisted, I said I'd like to be in weather because somebody that I was in class with at AR was Air Force weather and he had time to go to school. And uh -huh. That sounded like a good job. So. Right. That's what I ended up doing. I got sent to Chanute Air Force Base in Rancho, Illinois. And how long was that train? Oh, I got out of there in November. Okay. And you you went in probably in July. 
Yeah, and then there was a certain amount of time that we were in Pat's status, which is personnel awaiting training. Yeah. They were waiting for a spot in a class. That happens a lot. We didn't, yeah, we didn't have to do anything. I mean, I just, you just hang out and stay away from people trying to give you assignments. Right. So, but once we got into the, into the weather training, I think it was 13 and a half weeks, but I'm not sure. Okay, that's lengthy. Well, it's a lot to learn. Yeah. yeah. So, what sort of things do they teach you? Oh, in weather school, you had to learn um, all 27 states of sky, so you could look at the clouds and tell them what the state of the sky was. You had to learn to draw weather maps off of these codes. You teletypes would spit out these pages of stuff in synoptic code or different codes, and then you had to be able to take that and apply that to a weather map, which you'd go to each location and do all these little symbols. Um, you had to learn to do weather observations, which involves providing the information so that they can have that on the teletype. We learned to operate, uh, at that time, CPS-9 radar, which was really awesome. It's so obsolete now that nobody ever, ever heard of it. Um, but it was kind of advanced stuff at that time. Oh yeah, the CPS-9 was cool. Um, that's kind of, yeah, that's what we did. Yeah. Mm. So... Californians were teased. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think they are. Yeah. Every phrase there, we were service. teased. Anytime you're outside California, uh, yeah. Yeah. And they, you know, with a reference to, yeah, tailpipes and right, exactly. hot rodders and, yeah. Yeah. Um, so your, your assignments after training? Uh, Fair, Fairchild Air Force Base in Spokane. Oh, okay. So that's when you signed up at Eastern Washington University? Yeah, while well, I was up there. I was there for quite a while. Yeah. How, over a year? Oh, yeah. I was probably there two and a half years. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I went to Vietnam in February of 69. Right. So after November of 66, I showed up at Fairchild Thanksgiving Day, 1966. So that's almost two and a half years, yeah. Do you think like when you came out of uh, Illinois and finished your tech training, that they right away sort of picked when they were gonna send you to Vietnam? Or did it just happen? They were sending a lot of people that I served with around the same time. I could go to a, pretty much any Air Force base in Vietnam and find somebody I knew in the weather station. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about your assignment in Vietnam? I was assigned, well initially I was assigned to Camp Inari, which was 4th Infantry base camp up by Pleiku, oh, yeah. but and I got a letter from the sergeant there telling me, oh, welcome, we only get, we only get rocketed every once in a while, great. And then when I got to, when I flew in to Vietnam, I flew into Cameron, no, I flew into uh, Saigon, Tansanut. You're supposed to do uh, some detail at Camp Alpha, I forget how long they had to do that, but I didn't have to do it. When they heard I was weather, they sent me straight on another plane that day to Natrang, First Field Force Headquarters, where our detachment was. And I was assigned to Detachment 3, 5th Weather Squadron, Combat Weather Team 2. Okay. Natrang was where Special Forces... 5th Special Forces Group was right there, yeah. yeah. And in the meantime, before, after I got my orders and before I arrived, I went to uh, Altus Air Force Base and Fort Sill for Army Weather Support School. In Oklahoma. Yes. Yeah. So you got around a bit. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was fun. It was <clears> like, you know, nobody was shooting real bullets at us. I think the only people got hurt in that was, was the instructors who were playing with uh, blank 308 rounds and threw one in the fire and took some shrapnel in the leg. So, you, did you end up in Anke, Ke in Vietnam? An Ke was where Combat Weather Team 2 was. We provided weather support to the 1st Aviation Brigade. Uh, they were the air traffic controllers. They ran the airfield. Fourth, well, 173rd Airborne when we got there. Uh -huh. And then 4th Infantry came in after that. And I think the reasons we were there was because Air Force planes were flying in and out of there. And they wanted their own weather. Because right. the Army didn't have one. 
because I, you know, one of my friends was on at one of the special forces camps on the Cambodian border, and he said, you know, weather was critical because when the NVA attempted to overrun them, they had a lot of low clouds and they can't couldn't call in any air air strikes at all. You know, just just um, artillery. Yeah. We had two men assigned to the fifth. Special Forces group out of our detachment that would go to the Green Beret camps and teach them how to do weather observations. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And how to report and correct. There's a way of reporting it so it, weather is one thing that everybody in the world cooperates in. Everybody. Right. So when you do a weather observation in MK, that gets published all over the world. By the World okay. Meteorological Association. Now, was it a case that, given the very, very terrain in South Vietnam, uh, that the weather is very different in different parts of the country? Yeah, well, it's, and it's also north and south. Yeah. Yeah. North is cold, south is hot, just like here. So, in February of 1969, you went to Vietnam. I did. And you were assigned to. Detachment 2, no, Detachment 3 of the 5th Weather Squadron Combat Weather Team 2. So, tell us about what you did in Vietnam. Obviously. Uh -huh. Most of those had airfields. Right. Army doesn't have weather support. So, our unit would sign two-man combat weather team with Army air traffic controllers. We would provide hourly weather observations, which is a process. I told you what, there's a special form, and then you call that in, because we didn't have teletype, we'd call that in to some place, and that would end up in the weather that's being reported throughout the whole world. And it gave our pilots information that they needed. Also, the Army guys would call us, like the infantry would call and say, what's the temperature going to be today? Uh, what's the humidity going to be today? For the Army helicopters, it was huge that we calculate density altitude, which has to do with the temperature, the elevation, and the humidity of the air, so the helicopters can fly. Without good density altitude, they can't fly. So that's a calculation we had to make every hour, uh, winds and all that kind of stuff. So that was our basic job. We, we mostly would stay at Anke. I would go back to the train to get paid because your army couldn't pay me. So I had to go back to the train to get paid. It would that be a helicopter ride or a C-130 or a C-7 Alpha? Uh, one time it was a Chinook. But we'd go to back to get paid. Um, yeah, that was pretty much our job. We taught the army guys classes about how to do weather observations, which they ignored. Um, we interacted with a little bit hostile army leadership there. They didn't like the fact that I carried my weapon 24-7. Theirs were locked up in a in a bunker thing that they all had to go stand in line when we get hit. That was really stupid. And that I didn't wear the kind of hat he liked. I wore the bush hat and uh -huh. he didn't like that. But, uh, now did you say you were assigned to some artillery units? I made friends with people all over on cave. It was a pretty good side. Post Camp Redcliffe. And 4th of the 60th Artillery, and those guys and I, we really liked each other. They called me in the morning all the time for the weather. So they took me out one day. They had, they had um, armor personnel carriers with twin 40 millimeter guns on them, like the pom poms from the Navy. I'm sure that's where they got them. And they had two and a half ton trucks with quad 50s on the back. And they would Dust. We had a big mountain on our base called Hong Kong Mountain, and they would dust that mountain with twin 40s and quad 50s just for the fun of it to keep Charlie from going up on there because he could snipe down real easy. From there. And we had a radar set up, sight on top of people. So those guys said, We're going out on a mission to Happy Valley. You want to go? And I said, Yeah. So I called my commander down in the train. Can I go? He says, Yeah. Just don't get killed. I don't want the paperwork. So we get in an ACAB and head off into the boonies uh, on Highway 19 headed towards Quinion. Funny story is we're going there, we're coming up on a, on a crossroads and there's fire going on. Bang, bang. 
So we slow down and we're kind of looking. Turns out it's just the, the Army security guard there just playing with their guns, they're just shooting. So we go to make our left turn to go to Happy Valley just as the two and a half ton truck is trying to pass us. So the ACAV turns right into the side of the Army truck, knocks it into a ditch, breaks its fuel tank. I'm sitting on top of the ACAV, never even moved because we've got tracks. I'm not moving and it's yeah. heavy. So that was interesting getting that all done. Then we go to this village. I've got pictures of it, but I don't remember the name of it. And buy ammo, like 105s, uh, 82 illumination rounds, and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, 80 high explosive rounds, 82 millimeter high explosive rounds that didn't explode to keep them from making what we now call IEDs. Because uh -huh. Charlie would make bad things sure. out of our stuff that didn't blow up. And then we took those up to the hill to a rough puff camp, which your buddies in the 5th Special Forces group were running. Two guys were running the camp, and then they had all the Vietnamese would go there. Uh, popular forces is what they call it. Right. Yeah, and then they took it, and they were going to dispose of it. So that was kind of a fun day. I kind of like that day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we would get, um, I'd get a call on the radio or the phone. Hey, come over to play coup today. They're, we're having a party. So there's two men running the weather team, so one guy had to stay. Uh -huh. So we'd make a deal. I'm going to go. Helicopters flying by. Where are you going? We're going to play coup. Oh, we got a zoomie here. They called me a zoomie. I didn't appreciate that. But they called me a zoomie. And he wants to ride over to play coup. So we go over to play coup. Uh -huh. Yeah. I had a lot of freedom. I t took, uh, because there were two of us that run the team, one guy could, could cover the job. Right. So I had a cousin that was in 3-1 uh, Lima Marines up above Da Nang. Uh, we were worried about him. He wasn't uh, a high test score guy. And there was a time when they had lowered the standards because they were killing so many of us. Uh, so I went to go see him. Again, I called my commander, Major Grabaz, who I still hear from at Christmas. and. Uh, Say, can I go see my cousin in the Marines? Again, don't get killed. So I catch an airplane, probably a C-130, up to Da Nang. Get off. Where's the Marines? Freedom Hill's right up there. I go up there. I'm looking for 3-1 Lima. Oh, they're on Hill 37 North. Just go down that road to the north. It's about 4.30 in the afternoon. I got one magazine of M16 and one by John Wayne 38. Start walking down this road, and these Marines stop. Where are you going, Zoom? Well, I'm going to 37 to see my cousin. No, you're not. You're coming to 5 5 with us tonight. We don't, you're not going to get hurt out here. So I went and spent the night with an 82 millimeter mortar, I guess, company or whatever it was. Anyway, they were great. Just had a really great time with them. Good guys. And then the next morning, they took me over to find my cousin and see my cousin. And I talked to the corpsman about him, and they ended up sending him to Guam. So you made it. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's, he lives in San Clemente. Yeah. So, yeah. That's some of the fun things we did. Yeah. Well, but mostly it was providing weather support. And it was, right. yeah. Um, you settled back here in Sacramento once you ets I did. Well, yeah, I did for a while. My first job took me to Orange County. I was part of the field staff for the Republican State Central Committee. Okay. Down in Orange County. You did mention Costa Mesa. Yeah, that was my first job when I got out of the service. Okay. You didn't know that Karen Collins there, did you? I don't remember the names. That's a good friend. Yeah. 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 Um, but you also did some grocery business stuff again. After I worked at the Republican State Central Committee through the elections of the 1970s, it was a Reagan year. We had Reagan around all the time. Uh -huh. And then new management came into the state central committee. We had a new chairman who was really interested in reapportionment. So he laid off the entire field staff and spent the money on reapportionment, which didn't do him any good. And I went back home to go to school and I got a job at a grocery store. Okay. Was that a place here in Sacramento? The first job was up in Auburn, okay. at the Lucky Store up in Auburn. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, but at some point, you decide to go, go to Sac State, finish your right. degree. Uh, was it a business degree? Or? My degree was in, uh, Sac State was government with a minor in history. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you graduated from uh, Sac State in 75. Yep. And then you decided to go to law school. Yeah, I decided that before. Oh, okay. My last retention interview uh -huh. in the Air Force. Sergeant Cotton Road. Sergeant Rushford um, has been counsel regarding the benefits of a military career. He's been uh, counsel regarding the problems of a legal career. He's insisted upon going to law school. I cannot and will not try to dissuade him. Not that I memorized that. Yeah, no, not at all. Uh, you're also an assistant surgeon in the arms room. Yeah, that was after Lucky's. Okay. That was after Lucky's. I transferred down to the 48th and J Street store to get closer to home. Uh -huh. And then I had an opportunity to go work in the Capitol, which is a really good place to work when you go to law school. Because as a sergeant at arms, our main job in those days was sitting around waiting for some assemblyman to want somebody to do something for him or her. Yeah. So while you're sitting around, you can study. Well, that's kind of a juice job. It my, was, yeah. My, both John Hamilton and my roommate, Mike Mullen, both did that one summer yeah, you know, between good. semesters. So. Thank you, Bob Mulligan. Yeah, yeah he's a good guy. Um, OK, then how was it that you became the publications director for the California District Attorneys Association? Hmm. Was that after you were a DA or what? No, I'm trying to think how I ended up over there. Cause well, you were Justice Nicholson, who's, who, who, uh, the third district at that time, was the executive director. And I'm thinking he and my brother were doing criminal justice lobbying together. Michael was the anti crime director at the State Chamber of Commerce. Maybe he introduced me to Nick, and Nick uh, hired me to come work over there. And he was. Nicholson became a judge. He's on the third district court of appeal. Yeah, I think he's a friend of my friend uh, Mike Bigel. Mike Bigel. Yeah, everybody, he's, he's friends with everybody. He was a runner, I think. Mm, I don't know about that. Okay. Um, so, at some point, uh, are you going to law school at that time, or that came mm, later? Yes, I was in law school at that time. At George. Yeah, so I probably did that. After my second year of law school, probably. Once you graduated from law school, you wanted to be a prosecutor, I assume. Yeah, I was offered a job at the Ventura County DAs because I was working with them on an arson manual. And when I go to Ventura, I worked there when I was in the uh, Republican State Central Committee. I did. I was in Orange County for a while, and then they sent me over to Ventura to work on a com campaign there. Uh -huh. And so I knew the territory really liked it, and you know, why not move down to Ventura? Sure. Well, that's a nice place to live. We lived. It was good. Yeah, we right. lived in Ojai Valley. It was nice. Okay. Um, so you did that how long? 18 months. Okay. You got a better offer? Ed Davis, who had been the police chief of Los Angeles and, well. and had run for governor, I really admired him, and he needed, he got elected to the state senate and needed a lawyer to come to Sacramento to be his legal assistant. And his son-in-law had a case going with Inventura, a criminal case, and asked the deputy DA who would be a good candidate. He said, Rushford, he's from there and he's worked in the Capitol. So, oh, right. yeah. so I, I came up. Again, came home. And you did that for two years. Two years. Okay. Um, eventually, you go into private practice. And what was your two years. What was your special? Uh, insurance defense. Yeah. Yeah, still is. As we worked on a case together. We did. You were a good witness. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so finally, Jim, what are your thoughts about Vietnam? Mm hmm. Well, my main thought is it was really dishonest of Johnson and McNamara 
to fight a war they never intended to win, and it's been documented that they never intended to win, and kill 58,000 people of my generation, and God knows how many South Vietnamese and North Vietnamese, to no end. And that's pretty bad. So, but that, the country I like, the people I like, I had a good time when I was there, hard to believe, but I, I learned a lot, had some really interesting experiences, so, yeah. yeah. I would do it over, but I pretty bad that he killed all those people yeah, for nothing. Yeah, a different situation. It was terrible. Yeah. And there's a recent book that talks about it. Johnson was trying to keep everything going on there under wraps because he was trying to get his great society thing, his war on poverty going. He wanted the votes for that, didn't want to make anybody mad. And they never intended to win. They, they admit and they, they never intended to win. They just wanted to make a show of force so you can't mess around with America's allies in uh, Southeast Asia and then hoping for a peaceful resolution, which the North Vietnamese never had any thought of a peaceful resolution. They had fought the Chinese before and kicked them out. They fought the French before and kicked them out. And their idea of people who come to Vietnam from foreign countries and try and tell us what to do, we're going to kick their butt and kick them out. I mean, uh, it's listed that they lost about a million soldiers and they still didn't quit. That tells well, you yeah, totalitarian regimes don't kill so many soldiers they kill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look at Russia. The leader stayed alive. Um, Although Ho died while I was there. That was a good day. Yeah, no kidding. So, but that, the country I like, the people I like. I had a good time when I was there. Hard to believe, but I, I learned a lot. Had some really interesting experiences. So, yeah. Yeah. I would do it over, but I pretty bad that he killed all those people yeah, for nothing. Yeah, a different situation. Yeah. It was terrible. Yeah. And there's a recent book that talks about it. Johnson was trying to keep everything going on there under wraps because he was trying to get his great society thing, his war on poverty going. He wanted the votes for that, didn't want to make anybody mad. And they never intended to win. They, they admit and they, they never intended to win. They just wanted to make a show of force so you can't mess around with America's allies in uh, Southeast Asia and then hoping for a peaceful resolution, which the North Vietnamese never had any thought of a peaceful resolution. They had fought the Chinese before and kicked them out. They fought the French before and kicked them out. And their idea of people who come to Vietnam from foreign countries and try and tell us what to do, we're gonna kick their butt and kick them out. I mean, uh, it's listed that they lost about a million soldiers and they still didn't quit. That tells well, you yeah, totalitarian regimes don't kill so many soldiers they kill. Yeah. Yeah. Look at Russia. The leader stayed alive. Um, Although Ho died while I was there. That was a good day. Yeah, no kidding. Anyway, that's my story. Well, thank I'm you. I'm sticking much. to it. <laughs> thank you very much for that.